I've always been a May girl. Mm. Um, and I think even more so now because I'm looking at what's happening in number 10, making those changes to personnel, a new director of communications, bolstering your, your very close-knit team with people who've been around before. They understand how to do that kind of aggressive communication strategy. And I have to say, the Prime Minister's just put out a statement in relation to, to RAC, to concrete, and it is aggressive. Rishi Sunak says it's, quote, utterly wrong to blame him for the failure to detect RAC in schools earlier. Asked whether he would like to apologise after it was said he cut the school's rebuilding budget while Chancellor, Sunak pointed to his 10-year building programme, which he put in a fund for 50 schools to be refurbished. He's coming out fighting. Yeah. And when prime ministers do that, it tends to suggest that they recognise exactly what you said. People have made their minds up in, in by and large. You can do so much, but now is the time to really dig in and show them who you are. Because people have generally decided, which for me points towards a May election, I mean, I could well be wrong. But no, I'm with you. I'm, if it makes any difference, I'm with you. I think May is more likely than October. We can be October. wrong together. Yeah. Let's go inside number 10. Mm -hmm. uh, Rishi Sunak changed his cabinet. We'll talk about it in a moment. But there's been changes behind the scenes inside number 10, which could be more significant. Who's in and who's out? Yeah, now for most people listening to these names, you may not have heard of them before, but these people are incredibly important when it comes to the tone that comes out of number 10, the messaging, and actually the policy too. So... The most recent, probably most important change is Amber de Botton, who was the Prime Minister's Director of Communications, has left number 10 and been replaced by Nerissa Chesterfield, who was uh, Press Secretary. So, I mean, why does that change matter? Essentially, there has been a conversation, let's call it that, ongoing in number 10 for some time now about the tone of the Prime Minister's communication strategy. Is it a good idea for the Prime Minister to, to sort of sit back, say things when he thinks there's something to say, and not spend a lot of time talking about all the other things the government does day to day. That has been, you know, the, the strategy, perception yeah, yeah. on the strategy for quite a while now. But there's been a lot of disquiet and worry that it hasn't been working and that a more aggressive approach, a more targeted approach, and an approach which shows that Rishi Sunak does care and get fired up about something would be the better option. Now, Narissa Chesterfield, who's been with the Prime Minister for a very long time now, knows him very well, is an advocate of that strategy, thinks that he has a lot to give, a lot to show, and that people will like what they see. So the fact that she's now in that top job, I think, would suggest that we're about to see a change of tone. Now, whether it will work, because a lot of people in the country don't like what they see when they see Rishi Sunak, and although some polling suggests that because he's very wealthy, people think he must be doing the job for the right reason because the pay's not yeah. great, other people look at his use of helicopters and think, it's not for me. And he just doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... The, a change of tone in a more aggressive direction will be really interesting to see if it works, bolstered by some other behind-the-scenes additions of former staffers who've been brought in in strategy and sort of election planning roles who've been around the party for a long time and know the score, which Matt suggests to me that we could maybe be thinking about an election sooner rather than later. Uh, right, so that is the changes inside number 10. Right, now let's do number four. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, so, uh, you touched on it there a little bit. The things that Tories are cross about, um, because there is always this danger of sort of tail endy government, mm -hmm. Prime Minister in trouble. Instead of worrying about necessarily what the public are cross about, they become a bit obsessed with what their parties cross about, given their propensity for removing Prime Ministers. So, what is it that, that Tories are cross about right now? Overall, they are cross about the fact that they feel that there's an inertia in number 10. You hear more often than not people saying things like, well, lots of things go into number 10, not very much comes out. So they are worried that there's a lack of delivery going on and that when they have to go to on the doorsteps and say to people, here's what the government has given to you, they're struggling actually for the moment to say We're really anything useful. Rishi Sunak tried to do something about that with these pledges, but they were fairly big pledges. And we know from the Chancellor yesterday out and about suggestions that inflation will go up again in September, largely because of public sector pay rises influencing that. So it's not going to be smooth sailing. Migration, for example, record numbers of people coming across the channel the in small boats. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, it, it's all well and good saying, here are my five pledges to you and I'm going to fix them. If you don't deliver on them, that just gives lots of people reasons to say that you're failing. So... That's the biggest concern. I think in and amongst those, we touched on migration being one worry. There are others too. Energy policy, for yeah. example. The fact that people see the Prime Minister putting, and I know we're going to come back to talk about cabinet reshuffles maybe, but putting his allies into number 10, creating a mentality where he's driving everything from the top with people who are very loyal who will deliver, but not necessarily dissent. There's a bit of worry that actually is Rishi Sunak's vision the right one? What is his vision? And actually really? on energy policy, there's a round coming this week. Alok Sharma, former head of COP26, 
is to, is to try to basically defeat the, the government on wind farms. He's one of 25 yeah. uh, Tory MPs who signed essentially a motion in Parliament against the energy bill saying that Rishi Sunak should change his policy and allow onshore wind farms where people give their consent. It's quite a commonly held view among the Tory party and there is a suggestion that Rishi Sunak may well change planning laws to, to make them climb down. But it's a perfect example, isn't it, of something that the Prime Minister has gone out and about and said, no, 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 we won't allow this to happen, thinking that's what voters want, but his party actually aren't in the same place. And it's a reminder that it's not all about Rishi Sunak versus the nasty right-wing Tories. Right across the spectrum, there are issues, whether it's China or the environment or now schools and hospitals, you know, there are a whole load and it doesn't, it's not just placating uh, one wing. Well, let's move on because you mentioned uh, the cabinet. This is number three. <laughs> so last week, uh, Richard Sinat carried out his, uh, his um, mini reshuffle. Uh, Grant Shapps in at defence, Ben Wallace out, Claire Coutinho in his uh, energy secretary. The big question I want to ask you is, what does he do about Suella Braverman? Because there's talk of a bigger reshuffle. And there's an interesting question as to why he didn't do it all at once last week. Um, here is, in fact, here's a, just a reminder of, uh, of her. This is Suella Braverman speaking at the National Conservative Conference uh, early this year. I voted and campaigned for Brexit. Indeed, I'm a proud Spartan because I wanted Britain to control migration so that we all have a say on what works for our country. High-skilled workers support economic growth. So that was uh, uh, Swella Barman setting out her pitch. The interesting thing, if you follow the logic, like you were saying, of Grant Shapps, Claire Coutinho, close allies of Rishi Sunak, more allies inside number 10, actually, if there's another reshuffle, Swella Barman is not really Team Sunak. No, but it goes to something that you were saying, which is that he has a number of different wings and, and elements of his party which he needs to bring together. And this is a Conservative government at the end of 13 years of rule. There are holes all over the place and water pouring out, and he is not going to be able to patch all of them up in time. Having Suella Braverman at the Home Office does satisfy a certain element of people, and actually polling on the small boats policy is fairly good for the government. People generally think it's good to be doing something to control it. They don't always agree about Rwanda, for example, but the idea of control is good. And Suella Braverman is seen as somebody who can talk to that that right wing of the party. Now, he's got competing problems. First is if, if it's failing, if the Home Office is failing, which it, it, it is in some areas of policy, she's a good person to be taking those criticisms because there is a suggestion that if the Tories lose the next election, Suella Braverman might quite fancy herself as the next leader of the Tory party. So tarnishing her record is not bad if you are Rishi Sunak and, and thinking ahead like that. But at the same time, having somebody who uses language which does turn off elements of the public which he will need to keep on side to win the next general election is just as much of a problem. The bigger question is, are you talking to your base? Are your base going to keep voting for you, whatever? Or are you trying to appeal to a broader constituency of voters which you are going to need to stop Labour from, from taking votes off you? And that's the big electoral question, I think. OK, which brings us on to number... Two. To relaunch or not to relaunch. The big reset... Not the one, not the weird conspiracy theory online one. Um, the, the there's a lot of talk of relaunching and reset, but when it, I mean the number of prime ministers who've been around this, I mean actually I, you mentioned this this thing about things going to number ten and it gets all gummed up and never comes out, but that's been you know a complete level of endless prime ministers. As soon as you're on to talking about a relaunch, you've already sort of lost the lost the case, haven't you? He's still ultimately going to be Rishi Sunak with all the strengths and weaknesses that that got him the job in the first place. Yeah, I think that's right. And this idea of a relaunch, it's a bit concerning, isn't it, when you're talking about, you know, Rishi Sunak at the end of last term went to see all of his MPs, who, remember, were quite fractious because there'd been these losses of the by-elections and a general sense that the party was all over the place. And he promised, look, I have a vision and I'm going to tell you what it is in September. <laughs> Now, that, that's that's kind of quite an odd way of yeah. doing it because usually if you have a vision, you're quite able to articulate it, whether it's today, tomorrow, September or December. There is a, a lot of work going into Rishi Sunak's conference speech, which is going to be the moment for him to really tilt his party towards the next general election with an appeal to people to say, this is what I care about, this is what I'm for. We started to see some of that in I Have Daughters, I Care Very Much About Crime and Security. But that's an eye on some of the polling we've seen over the weekend from Lord Ashcroft, which is suggesting that Labour creeping slowly towards making progress in convincing people that they are not just the party of crime, which they generally are not seen as, 
but also that they are safe on the economy. Yeah. And that's a real worry for the Conservatives, because if Labour can make people believe that they will handle the economy with credibility, they're not going to spend lots of money and tax you a lot, then that puts the Tories in even more of a bind. So I think this quest for a vision, this quest for a reset, is very much at the forefront of those in number 10. And it's why, to go back to point one, five, rather, <laughs> to go back to point five, you're seeing these changes in personnel, you're, sh you're seeing a, a shift in the Cabinet, a bigger one to come all heading towards refining what that vision really is. Which brings us to number one. Good. So, the election. Uh, uh, what obviously all this is pointed towards. When do you think it's going to be, Kate? And this is the, this is the sort of answer we're going to hold you to. Replay endlessly. <laughs> uh, is it going to be... I mean, technically, it could be, what, the 28th of January 2025? which would mean an election campaign over Christmas, which feels unlikely. Are yeah. you in October or are you a May? I've always been a May girl. Mm. Um, and I think even more so now, because I'm looking at what's happening in number 10, making those changes to personnel, a new director of communications, bolstering your, your very close-knit team with people who've been around before. They understand how to do that kind of aggressive communication strategy. And I have to say, the Prime Minister's just put out a statement in relation to, to RAC, to Concrete, and it is aggressive. Rishi Sunak says it's, quote, utterly wrong to blame him for the failure to detect rack in schools earlier. Asked whether he would like to apologise after it was said he cut the school's rebuilding budget while Chancellor Sunak pointed to his 10-year building programme, which he put in a fund for 50 schools to be refurbished. He's coming out fighting. Yeah. And when prime ministers do that, it tends to suggest that they recognise exactly what you said. People have made their minds up in, in by and large. You can do so much, but now is the time to really dig in and show them who you are because people have generally decided, which for me points towards a May election. I mean, I could well be wrong. But no, there I'm are, with you. There I'm, if it makes any difference, I'm with you. I think May is more likely than October. We can be October. wrong together. Yeah, I mean, there's a it. reason for it in that the local elections will happen then anyway. Yeah. So if you were to not have a general election then, the Conservatives could risk a real kicking in the locals, lose even more of their council hold, yeah. and then still potentially lose a general when we've had even more time for things to feel like they're not going right. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah. I mean, look, it's a, it, whichever way you look at it, there are pitfalls, but I'm still a May girl. And before that, we've got a couple of by-elections as well. And we, we might get details of that today, Uxbridge and Rutherglen. Possibly, possibly yes. I think the Rutherglen no, by-election... Sorry, not Uxbridge, Mid-Beds. Uh, Mid-Bedfordshire. Yeah. So the Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election we're expecting on, I think, October 5th or October 12th. Um, if the writ is yeah. moved. There's a possibility the Tories could move the writ for mid-beds as well, which would make it around October 5th, which I think is the day after Tory conference happens. Uh, both of those, I mean, for Rutherglen and Hamilton West, SNP are very strong in that seat, but Labour think they could have a chance. I think they last held it in 2017. For mid-beds, I mean, it's it's a huge majority for the Tories, and it has been a Tory seat for decades, so if there was a real shift there, yeah. it could be a, yeah. a real moment.